Today I'm in conversation with Rufus May, who's a clinical psychologist. Hi, Rufus. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming and speaking in this series. It's brilliant. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about why it might be important to speak in this series about having lived experience as a mental health professional. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Natalie, for inviting me. Um, yeah, I guess I've been working as a psychologist for, since the late 90s. Um, and I trained at University of East London. Um, yeah, and I'm very passionate, I guess, about psychology, but in a very kind of holistic way where we include our own experience um, and reflect on it. And that hasn't always been my experience of the profession, I suppose. So I'm very interested in supporting Integrate because I think that it really encourages people to to get support and be more open, you know, about their vulnerability um, or... or their, their personal experience of distress and confusion. Um, I, I, at 18, had a big breakdown and um, had a very medicalised approach to that. Um, my parents didn't feel able to manage me and I was hospitalised several times and, and it was quite a, a draconian experience. It felt like it was like I, I experienced this other world, the severe sort of end of the mental health system, which... I think until you you are in a relative experience it, it it's another world it's another uh, universe in terms of if you're sectioned you kind of lose your rights and things get done to you and uh, I think it's slightly better in some ways than it was but 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 it, but it was a, a stark experience and and I think it really changed my life and. And when I, when I managed to pull things together and get support with that, when I managed to kind of reorganize and after about a year of using mental health services, leaving home helped and lots of things helped. But when I managed to return to education, I thought I want to try and make a difference and go back into the mental health system and promote a more listening approach I didn't feel like I'd really been listened to um, and, you know, I'd had medication forced on me and that had really brought out the rebel in me, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, which might have been a good thing, uh, but it, <laughs> yeah, um, and I really wanted to sort of prove the system wrong and um, so it was a kind of reverse psychology. I don't think psychiatry meant for that to happen, but maybe it was a good thing. Uh, so I wanted to, um, I think I, I was given quite a heavy, heavy diagnosis of schizophrenia. And, and again, that my rebellious side was, loved, loved the challenge of that, of proving people wrong. And like I wasn't going to be lifelong di disabled as they were implying. It felt like people were implying. Uh, and, uh, um, but it, I recognised that I needed to, approach life differently so it was a turnaround my breakdown in a way was a turnaround and that I and and for me I think a lot of people have more suffering I think my suffering was more before my breakdown <laughs> in some ways some days my breakdown was like a release of stuff and and it felt quite good for me in some ways although it was difficult for people around me it, it, um I was it's like I found my voice through it in some ways. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think bits of me that I pushed away came back and, and um, yeah, maybe they were too full on. So, but, 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 but they were important to hold on to. Um, and so, yeah, and then I, um, so I was on strong medication on and off through it. 14 months or something and I, I managed to come off that um, and I lived quite an alternative lifestyle for a while um, squatting with friends and eventually trained uh, did a psychology degree in my early 20s 
And I always felt like this experience of a breakdown and being diagnosed with schizophrenia and treatment and what had helped and what hadn't helped, I always thought it would be really useful to like talk about and like help me get on a university degree course. But then I, I was worried. I asked, I asked somebody when I was being interviewed for a degree course, do you think this will help? This is an undergrad and they were like, we're, I'm not sure. <laughs> and, and it was always a sense of, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Then when I, when I got the degree, nobody talked about their personal experience of, of the mental health problem. So I, I didn't either. So I learned to sort of keep quiet about it. Um, mm-hmm. So it was always this kind of big secret, but, but, but that's kind of influencing me a lot in my views and my questions. So I always had these, passionate questions but no one knew where it was coming from this kind of energy i'd sit near the front and be the annoying student who always asked the question yeah awesome. um, <laughs> and um yeah and that carried on and then when i i i, I did social work a residential social unqualified i guess care work i did a lot of care work in my 20s and actually didn't do a psychology assistant job just got into University of East London on the back of my care work and um, and again in the interview they said why did you um, choose you seem really passionate about schizophrenia and treatment for schizophrenia and why is that and I thought I said well my I've got a relative who's been diagnosed with schizophrenia which is true so I just told a partial truth and um, because I just didn't want to risk being being excluded or 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 treated differently I was worried about that as well actually I think you know and whether that would become a self-fulfilling prophecy if I was treated as less than or or over but but so I didn't I wasn't open um about it but that that was that was both exciting to kind of be this, have this slightly subversive approach, but it's also scary because it could be a dismissal offence, you know, to lie on your occupational health form, which is what I did, I guess, when when I got into um, clinical training. And actually, yeah, when I got into training, um, there was a form you had to fill out and I, I think I took it away with me or I was traveling. I went around the world. So I had this form on me. I didn't know what to do with it and whether to, and, um, and I think in the end I got it pickpocketed by somebody <laughs> in, me- in, in Mexico. And I was really pleased they stole it from me. <laughs> what were they going to do with that? I wonder. <laughs> I, 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 I probably at the time sort of read it as a message for the cosmos that I needed to, to keep it quiet about my previous identity <laughs> as a psychiatric patient. So, uh, so again, I went through my clinical training, keeping quiet until the third year. And I, I started to go to meetings. There were some meetings organized by a group called Psychology Politics Resistance. I don't know if that's in existence anymore. Um, no. Ian, what's his, Ian Parker from Manchester uh, Metropolitan. I think he was one of the organisers. But yeah, the, and places like that, I felt more comfortable to reflect on my own experiences, and that was really exciting. Um, mm-hmm. And wanted to bring it more out. Um, and when I when I sort of proved myself. When I qualified, then I opened up to the course and they said they would back me and they talked to occupational health. Um, and yeah, that was great. And then about a year into being qualified, I, I opened up to my colleagues as well because I, I, I wanted to use my story to sort of challenge the diagnosis of schizophrenia, the validity of it and, and the way we approach psychosis I wanted to use my own story because it was there was back then in the you know the 80s and 90s 
there was a lot of doom and gloom about psychosis. It was very yeah. fatalistic kind of approach. So I really wanted to use my story to promote a more hopeful, optimistic um, approach. Um, and that's uh, why I started to speak up about it. I gave a talk at a conference where I talked about how my personal experience influences my practice as a clinical psychologist. So I brought the two things together and that was a very emotional moment, you know, with a hundred okay. people, you know, witnessing it. And part of me really terrified that I was <sighs> going to be rejected. Um, so it was a powerful kind of ritual really because people did embrace me. I started to cry halfway through my talk. Mm. Um, I mentioned my mum <laughs> And it was just fatal. And then not just my <laughs> mentioning my <laughs> mentioning my mum, and then and then Sandra Escher, who's this you know, one of the founders of the Hearing Voices movement, was sitting next to me, um, and she said, "You're doing really well," because she knew it was my first talk. And that kindness just like <laughs> unleashed this this vulnerability, and I started to cry by talking. It was like I was. I, you know, I'd done a few press ups before the talk. I'd got my <laughs> my, fav my favorite shirt. You know, like smart casual. I, I was really trying to look the part of competent <laughs> professional, and then I was starting to cry. <laughs> and I don't normally cry, you know. And, then, and I was like, "Oh no, this is exactly what I didn't want it to happen." <laughs> and, um, and I said, "I think I'm going to have to stop," because um, I couldn't get the words out. Couldn't breathe. And somebody stood up at the back and clapped, and then everybody clapped in the audience. And I felt embraced, okay. and I could breathe, and then I could carry on the talk. And it was just a, it was a, a magical moment, really. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, so, and yeah, I don't know. it's hard when you keep something quiet for a long time and you come out, I think for a lot of people, how you do that, I think it can become a, a bit dominant for a while. So I think for a while it was like quite strong thing. And then the media got interested. So I had a lot of attention around it as well. So media are bored with it now, but back then it was like, <laughs> <laughs> Rufus May, tell us your story. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I, I kind of, you know, the the person who wanted to um, promote change and promote more holistic, collaborative approaches to mental health, you know, who wanted to use that platform and felt like I could, um, the media could help me influence change in the mental health system. So I, I kind of really embraced that um, for a while. Um, yeah. That was it's good and bad because that takes up a lot of your time doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's mixed, yeah. And, and I guess, I guess, when you're really passionate about so it's not just a job, like it's a vacation, it's, you know. Yeah. And it's like, and then how do you make space for your family, you know, for your friends, you know, for. for it's it's a tough one to, to to balance. I guess I've spent the last twenty years trying to get that balance. <laughs> you know, balance it out a lot more than perhaps initially. I just feel really. Uh, there are a couple of points in your in the story that you were saying about your experience that really hit with me. One was about how. Uh, it was almost worse before your breakdown in a way and that the breakdown was a, a big release of something as painful as it was um, and, 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 and pulling back parts of yourself in uh, and, and trying to make sense of a whole in some kind of way and, 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 and in a way my breakdown felt very similar to that actually it, it, it has to be the best thing that, that ever happened to me I, I would say in some senses because I was mm. clearly carrying around um, awful, an awful lot of weight and struggle uh, before then, some of which I was just less aware of, you know. Um, and the breakdown, although terribly 
horrifically painful was was something that reset everything um and life's been so much better since then and I had the help that I needed so that that was one thing and then the other thing you were saying about um breaking down into tears in front of people I I've done a, a few talks and and I, I mostly managed not to, although I've been always climbing the walls of anxiety before the first one, you know, having, you know, trusted friends kind of boom, boom, down, take me down off and go, it's okay, you can do it. But there was one where uh, it was a talk um, that I did and I followed somebody who was talking about racism in the profession. And um, there were lots of quotes um, of people, of how they had experienced othering and, uh, exclusion and powerlessness, and also just all sorts of things, just a whole raft of incredibly powerful uh, direct quotes from, from people. And, and um, it, you know, some of those could have been transposed directly onto experiencing stigma and silencing about lived experience, mental health difficulties, some of them. And by the time I went to stand up next, I, 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 started talking but I could I just couldn't I just couldn't get it together I was so full of such desperate upset and sadness and and the trauma of it all um it, it just had completely linked with my experience just you know in, in a kind of a parallel way that I just burst into tears you know in front of a room <laughs> full of psychologists mm -hmm. it was a DCP thing um, and, uh, and I'd never really done that before and I, and I just did. And, and, and then I, I just couldn't really speak. Um, but, but afterwards I, I, I kind of ended up saying something, but really talking about the upset actually and where it came from. Um, it's, it just is the hardest thing to do when you're, you're bringing all of yourself to something, you know, because you feel like for me, it felt like that was the right thing to do. And, uh, in order to, to kind of raise what gets scythed off, you know, and left at the door. I mean, we talk about how speaking from a whole position is something that is in, inherently, although it can be very painful to get them much, much healthier around her. You know, when we talk about how things can get kind of split off or, uh, you know, d depends on, you know, what language you want to use, depending on your different models and everything like that. But, um, and yet, and yet there seem to be so many places kind of within the profession and within, you know, wider within men mental health professions at large, where these things kind of, you know, get put into shadowy corners, put under carpets, you know, ask, you know, leave them at the professional door. These are implicit messages that are really unhealthy, that need challenging. Yeah. Need the rebel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, how do we, I, what I try to do, I guess, in mental health amongst, you know, not just psychology, but mental health staff in general is, is try to model contained vulnerability. So, mm. And, and encourage that amongst everybody that, that we, so if we do a staff reflective practice, we might go around at the beginning saying how we're all feeling and I've got a list of feelings and needs and pass it around to help guide people a bit if they want that. But, and I'll start, so I'll model it. And that seems to help people be a bit more honest and people find out things about colleagues they didn't know. And it's, it's lovely, you know, and, and, um, yeah, that but you can create safety through through sharing and, and yeah, doing it in a balanced way, in a way, a democratic way, where everyone gets a say you know, if they want to. Um, yeah, that's really important. I think when I was training, didn't get. I can't remember tutors, people teaching us really reflecting much on their personal experience or emotions very much. And, and we were, of course, we're taught in degrees to write in the third person. So to detach yourself, to talk as this, you know, robot, really, this, 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 this scientist who observes things objectively. And what does that do to us at degree level? What does that do to us 
in terms of where we've where we I don't know if, I think the Greek courses might still be like that <laughs> but what does it do to us in terms of how much we value our own experience yeah um, yeah and and so it's a that's an unfortunate byproduct maybe of how much our society values science science and objectivity is that the self can get a bit lost yeah there's often uh, about this valuing idea that um this people can move kind of a bit more towards support talk now and trying to open conversations and i think you know these 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 things are opening up mm. um, and especially since COVID and, you know, it seems to give permission for people to feel not okay. And I hope mm. that lasts. Um, mm. Although it's, it's coming in, it's COVID has kind of slotted itself, if you like, within a, you know, a whole background context and lots of difficulties about saying that. So there's going to be, it's going to be snagging stuff along the way. And I, you know, and I hope it, it has, you know, a lasting impact on, on people being able to be human as it were, just simply mm. be who they are and, and, and to some extent not feel like, not have to feel like superheroes or kind of idealized up there, in which case you can't break down, you know, 24 hours a day, you have to be utterly 100% containing at all times, <laughs> almost kind of over identified with the services that, you know, provide that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, so, so there's more of a move towards kind of support talk, perhaps, but also support talk only is support talk. It's only kind of wrapping people up in only ever needing support. And at the nth degree, it, it doesn't really talk much about flourishing and it doesn't really talk much about recovery. Um, and it doesn't really seem to import the idea of the recovery model onto the inside, you know, self-support. Um, so it, it, it can unintentionally... Um, Pay down the idea of you know then the, the gifts or as um, as David Gilbert would say, kind of the jewels from the cave of suffering that you can you can bring you, you can bring back with you to help improve things and make things better, and so then you get into the valuing. And right. often the, the so it's a bit charitable, is it? It's a bit like oh, we need to be empathic to these. This. Yeah, yeah. And it's finally that, like pitying yeah and you're only ever weak and you're only ever in need of support as opposed to you can you can you know come back in utter strength um and your experience can actually be something which builds you know you can build builds you up perhaps even uh leave you in you know in, in a transformation way you know in, in, in a better place than you might have been before or just different um and that you can bring back something of value here so yeah. to the extent to which we value is the extent to which we kind of destigmatize in a way, I think. Yeah. There's a value I've always used in the hearing voices groups that I've been, I don't hear voices, but I've been attracted to the hearing voices movement networks, partly because it was their kind of event where I first gave that talk. So I kind of felt very bonded, uh, but the, the self-help groups that I've been involved in, we always say everybody here has expertise and wisdom. Yeah, and so through your own experience, there is expertise and wisdom and, and we need to find ways to listen to that in each, in each of us. That is challenging to a profession like psychology because it doesn't have to be, but but I think traditionally, well, you get resources by saying you're the expert. So, so um, if we're saying everybody's got expertise and wisdom, it's a bit challenging. I think. I think. But I, I think it's liber ultimately liberating because I meet people who've trained as psychology, and they can be really anxious that they to have all this wisdom. You know, to be the person who, who has to fix people. Um, and actually, you know, that, that's, we're setting ourselves up a bit there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. How can we create 
create that respect you know, for the wisdom that comes with vulnerability. I like meditation. I think we talked about this before. I like I like meditation teachers. Uh, I have problems with the hierarchy in meditation teaching, but uh, and the, but but that's my rebel struggles with hierarchy. Uh, but uh, unless I'm at the top of it, of course. <laughs> 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 um, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, this when when I was really. I found it uh, um, inspiring when I started learning about meditation and hearing, going to talks by meditation teachers and they would reflect on their own experience of, you know, not being mindful or, uh, you know, they, their desire for fish and chips, whatever it was, but just talking about their own experience. Oh, oh, this is how you can also, you know, talk about behavior and experience and the mind and, interpersonal relationships and bring yourself in as well you know just just gently there's lots of gentle ways to do it um mm. and I, I was like ah oh. i mean that's why i like mindfulness because mental health professionals get permission to talk about their own experience as well um and i think that wasn't that hasn't been there very much in in, in a lot of training um I had a, I had a professional, you know, I had a, when I first was talking about this kind of thing, I think she heard me on the radio. <laughs> I quoted her on the radio, <laughs> but this, a colleague of mine said, said to me when, when I first opened up, she said, these things are best left to the, left to the therapist's couch. And then I quoted her on the radio and she heard it. <laughs> I heard you quote me, she said. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, so she was from a very psychoanalytic background where, you know, per reflection on personal experience is valued, but it was still very compartmentalized. You know, it wasn't something for, to, to share her version of it. You know, I'm not saying all psychoanalytic uh, approaches have that, but it was very much, you know, don't talk about it openly hopefully that's changing um but i went back then when i started talking about it a lot of colleagues behaved like i was letting the team down and i was and they didn't they felt intimidated and um what was i going to do next was i going to was i going to make psychology our psychology team seem really anti-psychiatric and actually psychiatrists were less threatened by me than psychologists i don't really understand that but um well i have had lots of psychologists who haven't who've been you know warm and accepting of me too <laughs> <laughs> what should we talk about now <laughs> <laughs> we had uh we we did think about um, competency and lived experience as being something that's quite fused as two yeah. ideas or, or incompetency really and lived experience. And I think I was saying that these yeah. are on two, two different axes almost, if you like, you know, yeah. um, the lived experience and mental health difficulties just, if you like, just lived experience and mental health difficulties doesn't necessarily say anything about your ability to practice um, yeah. as, as, a, as a mental health professional. But there's so much stigma that kind of gets into that space. Uh, that these things get fused and it's sort of risk then, risk assessment, occupational health, start taking an interesting stance, you know, whereas maybe that's been different if you're a peer support worker, you know, bringing your lived experience. Some people have experienced that um, occupational health can suddenly take a bit of a, a flip change stance. Um, all of a sudden when you're, you're then going to be in a registered profession. Um, yeah. Not all the time, but just, you know, some things that I've heard, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess as a supervisor to trainees, I always try and create space for them to talk about 
you know their their vulnerability and it's okay to cry it's okay and and that they haven't always had that message you know? and, and, and and there is this idea that distress is confused for incompetence and actually there's times when I can be vulnerable confused that I can be really actually better at my job sometimes more more empathic more sensitive yeah but, and there are you know there, there could be times when I'm confused where I probably need to take take time out or or be be careful you know um so but they're not mutually exclusive yeah there, there's this idea um yeah, very simplistic ideas, really, and it's healthy actually to to cry in supervision. <laughs> you know, it's that's a, a work on that, yeah, and, and to, to reflect on feelings and um, and I think you know my my partner, um, she 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 wouldn't be able to hold down a full time job because of fatigue and you know, various challenges. But 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 she's very wise, you know. I can, you know, I get some great informal supervision <laughs> from talking to <laughs> her, you know. And it's just like, so you, she, but she's vulnerable, you know. She, she's, you know, she she. There was a conference once called the Big Bad Experience, and uh, people, if you wanted to, you could put a sticker on yourself. Uh, fragile she thought you know, she really related to that so like, great to wear a sticker that actually said fragile you know and mm. it, you know but through her she's highly sensitive but there is great because she's highly sensitive there is great wisdom you know we used to value tr traditional communities would value sensitive people because they could pick up on danger before anyone else <laughs> yeah and, 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 and so they would have a spiritual role in the community and in our, you know, industrious, competitive society, that sensitivity is often devalued, you know, and that needs to, we need to challenge that and create, you know, in ourselves and in, in society, have those, that prejudice that's around. I agree. I guess there's a sense of trying to get it knocked out of us in a way, uh, but actually yeah. that's... Yeah, and the denial that we end up doing, like me in my training, mm. that 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 is not healthy for us. Um, and you know, honesty creates emotional safety. And if we can't be honest in our work, how can we, you know, get work well with each other? And yeah, I've certainly had the experience one of once or twice with colleagues who probably have you know they've got personal experience they haven't felt safe enough for whatever reason to share be honest and it's it's been really difficult it's been really difficult yeah. to give them the right kind of support but i understand why they might, might be like that right i don't know the whole story at all but and mm. it, so if we can this you know this is why this series is important to try to um create more acceptance and openness. And I think you can balance the two, like being boundaried with being um, open. They're both important. They're both important, aren't they? And people share for different reasons as well. You know, people share kind of in general, kind of in, across society as part of activism or for change or to feel a sense of uh, congruence or authenticity, congruence of themselves, authenticity in, 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 in walking their talk, you know, and in standing up for what mm. they believe in and what they do. Um, mm. There is something about congruence that's so powerful uh, the, the, the people have found that as their right path, you know, and, 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 and they'll, they'll find ways of working where that's, that's going, where they're going to be able to do that, you know, and they'll choose to work in places accordingly. Um, and then there are, of course, the, the other kind of uh, 
options and choices around sharing kind of on a more day-to-day basis, maybe in placement, uh, mm-hmm. during training, um, in your qualified work with your supervisor or with your colleagues. And then there seems to be another a, a different area around sharing in the therapeutic relationship, which is, has a kind of a different frame and intention around it. Uh, so it's a bit of mindfulness about what it is you're sharing and why, and is it um, helpful for the other person and, um, some, how some would people. we ever know that? <laughs> how would we ever know? I know. I guess, you know, people talk about, you know, according to formulation, according to discussions and supervision, oh. that it's, it's more of a tool sometimes. Some people say that way. I don't know what you would say. Yeah. What do you say? I don't think we can ever know whether it's going to be helpful for someone else. I think we, or I share with people what I feel comfortable sharing. Yeah. So, and that will differ from person to person. You know, it will be about, and yet, yeah, of course, parts of me might think it might be useful for this person to know this about me. Um, I found the book, uh, Personal Narratives of Therapist Lives by Michael White, helpful um, as, as a kind of reference point. Um, and, but he talked about decentered sharing in a way, to, a way that, like I talked about, contained vulnerability. You know, how do you share, sharing stories is a natural way to help each other, you know, it's, um, and I, I was talking recently with, with um, a clinician who, who was seeking help, who was a whistleblower, and he was, um, he, he felt, um, you know, under persecution from Okay. from management and I shared with him some of my experiences of that um, and probably what I said took up two percent of the session yeah, so so it's so I wasn't taking up center stage but I was you know, uh, it was a way to empathize yeah, and it felt natural and I felt safe said sharing it with him but with somebody else I might not feel safe safe sharing that story um yeah and so yeah th- um yeah yeah so they in michael white he talks about if you share a story it can help somebody else build their story so in narrative therapy it's all about helping people build build yeah. you know uh helpful narratives um and it i guess it's part of being a whole person is is yeah and it something you never stop learning about I guess communication so I can't I don't won't pretend to have all the answers on it (laughs) (laughs) that's a shame Rufus that's a shame (laughs) so they'll write them down a bottle them yeah but but as a meditation teacher I can put you in touch with who who has all the answers (laughs) yeah does he write brilliant um I'll I'll tell you email me (laughs) that sounds good though it sounds good (laughs) Yeah, so, I mean, thank you for talking through kind of how your lived experience, kind of how your, what your relationship has been like to your lived experience through that um, professional lens, kind of pre-training, during training, and and kind of where where it could belong, and where it felt like it couldn't belong, and, 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 and then sense of some kind of reclaiming that you know after qualification and and doing it in concert with other allies and and feeling met and how it's informed your kind of beliefs and your practice kind of going forward and um it's really lovely to hear such a holistic view and uh, again coming back to you know as close as we can ever get to being our whole selves and sense of congruence in what we do and and then thinking about sharing and when that happens all of it so I think you know anybody anybody watching who is interested in you know how how do we actually even talk about this kind of stuff you know how do we get into it and and uh and yeah I just think they would find that really helpful yep yep can I say one more thing yeah yeah so, so yeah, 
thing I I guess I've referred to it I guess a model that helps me is just this idea that we all have it's in different therapy models so it's not but in the approach I'm familiar with is voice dialogue and it's just this idea that we have different parts we all do and we have a rational part and we have a responsible parent part or we can give them different names as well it doesn't have to be fixed um, but we also have a playful side and a vulnerability and a you know a spiritual you know contemplative side and 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 that they're all important and so as much as is possible trying to create space for those um in 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 everyday life you know whether that's in paid roles or not and trying to honor those those different parts and create spaces for colleagues to bring those out and people we're working with as well so yeah that's been really important i think and i think mental health can be very yeah uh, secular responsible and so we're trying to bring in creativity allow people to play and um, mm -hmm. that's a nice way a gentle way i've found you know I've, I've done my sort of activism stuff but now i try and it's more this kind of playful side the clown the, yeah. the dancer the uh drama you know bring those in with we're gonna we're gonna get an opera singer to come in to the, the hospital soon and <laughs> amazing <laughs> yeah yeah she does an opera um, for the people she's she um, while lockdown's been happening she's just been going around communities and singing in the street and, and she's up for mm -hmm. coming into the hospital um, just seeing how that helps people become more the arts help people become more themselves to you know bring different parts in a humor stuff yeah so that that's that's really um i think i think probably uh yeah in my teaching i'll try and create space in clinical training courses you know for us to do playful games as well as you know, talk about serious stuff you know, and yeah. <laughs> I bring the body in as well you know, but oh, yeah. again, that's something that, that can be neglected. It can get very heady. Stuff. Yeah. 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 Bring it all together. Yeah. Well, I hate to bring all this together to an yeah. end, but I, I guess we have yeah. to. But, uh, yeah. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, really awesome. And, uh, and yeah, I hope we stay in touch, you know. And, yeah. Uh, good brilliant all right thank you very much rufus okay you're welcome thank you